Seeing the rather anonymous looking Western Bridge today, it is hard to appreciate the skill and ingenuity that went into its construction more than a hundred years ago. With the arrival of motor traffic in the new Edwardian era, Weymouth's dilapidated old backwater bridge had long passed its useful life. It was not capable of safely linking the town centre with the new big suburb of Weston. The Dorset Council passed responsibility back to the Weymouth Council, who in 1914 obtained an Act of Parliament to authorise a new bridge. And it was to be built of stone. But along came the Great War and everything stopped. When peace arrived in 1919, the Council had a bold and radical rethink. A leading civil engineer, H. W. Fitzsimmons, was engaged to design a new embankment dam and roadway. The contract was awarded to the British Construction Company, who suggested building it using the newly patented Vibrocell method. The idea was that the dam, erroneously called a bridge, would be formed between two retaining walls, the walls being interlocking hexagonal reinforced concrete caissons. Dorset Council were due to contribute to the £34,000 cost, but they were not convinced that the unusual design would work, so they brought in their own consultant engineer, a Mr W. D. Foxley, who roundly opposed that design. He was adamant that the unconventional construction of the bridge would not bear the weight of traffic. However, on the advice of another independent consultant, the Ministry of Transport did approve the design and work started in February 1920. In preparation, the old timber bridge was bolstered to provide a working platform for the cranes and machinery. Being closed to the public, a temporary walkway was built on top of Coode's Weir Dam of 1872 nearby. I'll stick with the original imperial dimensions of the time. Over the following year, the caissons were constructed and placed in position to carry a 26 foot wide roadway with a wide footway each side. The new bridge was to be much shorter than the old timber one, which called for extensive filling on both sides of the backwater. Now it becomes interesting. Rather than building the structure in position, groups of five hexagonal cells were constructed remotely on a specially prepared bank by the side of Commercial Road. The main cells were hollow hexagons, seven foot centre to centre across flats, eight foot four inches across corners. The outside walls were just four inches thick and the internal ones only three inches. They were reinforced with expanded metal. The engineer reported that the method of building was to first lay down timbers to carry the concrete units during construction. Felt was then placed over the site to prevent the concrete floors from adhering. Seven foot six inch posts were then erected to which the formwork shutters were bolted in three feet lifts. The expanded metal reinforcement was inserted into the thin panels before the concrete was poured. The strength and quality of the concrete in those wafer thin sides is evidenced by those walls being still largely intact more than a century later. Each set of five caissons was floated off at high tide. Radipole Lake was still tidal then, and then manoeuvred under the old bridge. The calculations ensured that the units floated to draw precisely two foot seven inches of water with a freeboard of barely two inches. The final upper panels had to be built up while it was still floating. The engineer commented, it was surprising how expert the men were at the work 
which at times was difficult, as the caissons behaved like a ship at sea. They also had a sense of humour, as can be seen by the Union Jack and White Ensign flying on the vessel here. An eleven-ton priestman grab and a steam crane were used to dig a three-foot deep trench in the backwater bed for the foundation. The dredging was a tricky operation, as in May 1920 a crane overbalanced and fell over the side of the bridge. Fortunately, the driver escaped without injury. For the underwater foundation, a diver put in pegs and screeded the base on a slant at a 1 in 24 4% batter so that the installed caissons tilted slightly inward. At the back, stout timbers were driven in at the inclined angle to guide the caissons as they were gently lowered onto the footing. The men are seen here with poles to keep everything in position. Once sunk into place, the caissons were filled with gravel. Specially strong, heavily reinforced units were made to support the culverts in the centre of the dam. Despite weighing nearly a hundred tonnes, those bigger caissons were successfully floated and sunk into position. In the centre of the dam were eight reinforced concrete culverts constructed in pairs. Here you can see the steel reinforcement bars being bent to the required profiles on the West Ham shore. In transit any miscalculation or defect could have sunk the heavy unit to the bottom and recovery would have been impossible. These tunnels were 43 feet long and 6 feet wide being designed to carry the normal flow of water coming from the upstream river way which fed into the lake at Radipol. That would ensure that the normal water level in the soon-to-be non-tidal Radipol lake would be maintained at the predetermined level. The four outer culverts had tidal flaps to prevent seawater from entering the lake. As with the caissons, the 75-ton culverts were floated into position on spring tides. When in position, they were quickly sunk by knocking out the timbered ends. The engineer reported that they all sank to within half an inch of the intended position. The middle four culverts were fitted with manually operated penstocks, which would be opened to release higher volumes of water in storm flood conditions. The last of the caissons was installed on the 15th of March 1921. With walls completed, the space between them under the road was filled with thousands of tons of shingle and sand taken from Weymouth Beach near the Jubilee Clock, which the council claimed resulted in a much needed cleaning up of the beach, at a place where incidentally a few years later the esplanade was widened. Concrete beams were laid above the walls with troughs for utility mains and pipes. Along each side of the bridge were concrete panelled parapets with embayments for seats supported on these massive brackets. Ornamental pillars terminated each end and gas lamp pedestals completed the scene. The completed dam ensured that under normal conditions the water level in Radipo Lake was fairly constant. And for the first time the lake was entirely fresh water, downstream seawater being stopped by the sluices. A reminder that the backwater was in use in prehistoric times was the discovery of a bronze sword in the excavations. On the 13th of July 1921, amid blazing sunshine and bunting, and watched by thousands of people, the new road was opened by the mayor 
Councillor R. A. Bolt, then the Chairman of Dorset County Council, Colonel Gooden, unveiled a bronze panel as a permanent record of the occasion. Praise was given to all those involved in the remarkable work, including consulting engineer Mr. Fitzsimmons, the head of the British Construction Company, Percy Westercott, and the borough surveyor, George Whitaker, who saved the extensive approach road works. Designed and built when there were few motor vehicles on the road, Western Bridge became an essential part of Weymouth's road network for nearly seven decades, eventually carrying weights and volumes of traffic undreamt of in 1920. The completion of the Western Bridge Embankment Dam opened the way for major developments along the eastern shore of Radipole Lake, all to help ease the desperate unemployment problem. In addition to the new long Radipole Park Drive, large areas were reclaimed for a bowling green, beautiful public gardens, playing fields and an extensive linear park. The story of those lovely developments is told on the Friends of Radipole Park and Gardens website. On the other side of the lower backwater, a new road was built to link Boot Hill with the new bridge. This was Westway Road, which opened in 1932. By the 1960s, traffic congestion in the town centre had become intolerable. It could take 20 minutes to get through two-way St Thomas Street in peak summer traffic. Borough engineer John Housigo devised a one-way traffic scheme in which Western Bridge was a key element. That's when I came on the scene in the engineers department to work up the scheme. Inaugurated on the 1st of June 1970, the gyratory system involved the construction of a link road across the middle of the Malcolm Regis Gardens and traffic signals at the Westway Junction. This aerial view shows how main road traffic was routed around this part of the town. A unique feature was a contraflow across the bridge for buses only. The drivers had to press a button to get a green light, but the bridge could not cope with the volume of main road traffic now using it. The solution was to remove the southern footway to make way for a third traffic lane. To keep pedestrians safe and happy, I organised a separate footbridge, which was constructed in 1973. traffic moved reasonably well until everything changed in 1987. That is when Dorset Council completed the Weymouth Way Relief Road up the west side of Radipole Lake towards Dorchester and built a new Swannery Bridge across the lake. At a stroke the new roads made the old Western Bridge redundant. It would no longer play any part as a traffic route so in September 1987 I found myself making a formal application to the Magistrates Court to stop up the bridge to vehicles, effectively pedestrianising it, under Section 116 of the Highways Act 1980. Western Bridge still stands and its function as a regulating dam remains vital for the nationally important RSPB Bird Sanctuary and Swannery. The dam and infilling have changed Radipole Lake almost beyond recognition. No longer a vast open expanse of partially tidal water, sediment and silt from the River Way 
has almost no outlet to the harbour, so has accumulated over the years, creating islands, channels and banks, which are now valued habitats. Western Bridge and Dam stands as a testament to the ingenuity and skills of the engineers and builders of more than a century ago.